Uh, thanks so much. Uh, it's great to be here. I've given a, a few talks at Harvard, uh, and they've all, they've all led to, to really good things. Um, uh, and so thanks to, to Barbara uh, and Michael and Carol uh, for setting this up. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to keep this interactive. Uh, I've got a bunch of slides. I have no, no uh, special desire to get through them all. I'll make sure to leave some time for, for Q&A at the end. Um, but, but great to jump in with questions or comments or, or anything. Um, and let me just start off by uh, uh, giving an example of, of the kind of thing I do and, and also uh, specifically uh, naming the kind of main project I've worked on uh, for the last 10 years, um, or the last, uh, of the last 10 years since I've worked the most on, which is an a open source product called ComCare. And this is a picture of a, a community health worker uh, using ComCare, which is uh, software running on the phone to counsel, uh, let's, let's say, a pregnant woman um, during a household visit. Uh, and just to get a, get a sense, uh, like, do you all know like, mHealth? Is that a word that's familiar to, to people? Uh, and do you all have a sense of, of community health programs in sub-Saharan Africa or India? Uh, not so much. Okay. Mobile apps, you know. Um, uh, I don't have it here, but I have um, a slide that I've used sometimes where I just list out jargon from, from computers and jargon from health, uh, and then ask people which they recognize. It's a really good way to identify your audience is seeing what totally cryptic random you know, association of letters they, they know. Uh, and it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's fun for people as well, because they realize what they, that the two sets you know, from a third view are, in, are equally unknowable, but they know one and not the other. Um, uh, and I, what I've really done is, is move in between those two groups, um, uh, uh, liaison, uh, I'd say, between the, the techies and the healthies. Um, but so I'll talk more about it later. I'll, I'll talk more about ComCare um, and just say a you know, word about community health programs. Uh, so community health workers are typically people recruited from the communities they serve, um, you know, billions of dollars of, of aid each year often like end up at that front line of like what a community health worker or other kind of frontline worker um, uh, interfaces with the, the intended beneficiaries of that, of that aid or that health effort. Community health workers are often the, the first and sometimes only point of contact for people living especially in uh, rural poverty with the health system. Um, and they could do great things, but there's a lot of challenges for supporting that workforce. Um, and and ComCare is a mobile aid uh, to help them register clients, track clients, and provide uh, support for doing the, to make those counseling sessions more effective. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk more about that, but it just gives you a, a sense of where we're going. Um, and then that open source product, I'll also tell you more about the company I work for, Damagi, uh, which is uh, based in Central Square. Um, and we've been, we've been doing well, we've had steady growth uh, uh, for the last uh, uh, three or four years with our, uh, with our product. And so this is a graph of the, the number of uh, frontline programs that are using ComCare. So there's about 170 uh, frontline programs actively using uh, ComCare today, most in Sub-Saharan Africa or India. Um, they vary in size, uh, sometimes as few as 10 users to start out with, sometimes hundreds. Um, and the total number of users is, is, is getting there. There's maybe about 5,000 users, um, which isn't, isn't that many, but we've been doubling uh, more than once a year. Uh, uh, um, so we're, we're happy with the growth. And then we work with, with a lot of the big international NGOs like Save the Children, World Vision, CARE, Catholic Relief Services, Pathfinder is a, a similar group based here in, in the Boston area. Um, and have funding from the Gates Foundation and, and the U.S. government to do this work. So we've had, you know, uh, we're, we're a long way to go ahead, but we're generally feeling uh, that we're, we're succeeding and in, in getting, uh, you know, testing out the idea that ComCare can improve those community uh, health programs. Um, and then uh, just to show you a little bit about my path through all this, so, so back in, in 98 till about 2004, I was a happy-go-lucky AI and human-computer interaction researcher, uh, jogging on the Charles every day. Had a, I was working at the Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab, working with great colleagues like, like Michael Mitsumaker very, very closely. Um, and then, so I, I quit all that, um, got a, a master's of public health at a, at a local university. Uh, 
here at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and then took off the, the day after graduation to Tanzania, uh, where I worked uh, on uh, data systems for a AIDS treatment program. And then for, for a few years, really uh, lived a, a fun and, and somewhat hectic and kind of a typical expat uh, do-gooder lifestyle of uh, jumping around different countries uh, uh, and um, uh, for three years, I didn't really live in any one place. I was really just literally on the, on the move quite a lot, mostly between Tanzania, uh, Rwanda, and South Africa. But, but I had a very fat pa uh, passport book and was, was all over. Um, and then around 2008, uh, from my perspective, kind of I was very uh, uh, lucky with timing. The, the mobile health became a very, you know, the, the, the cell phone revolution had, had happened in, in a lot of low-income countries. Uh, and the idea of using that to, to help with health in particular, but development generally was, became very popular. The term M health came about, and I was, I was very well poised uh, to uh, uh, sort of catch that wave. And I was uh, uh, an M health. I was like a, you know, running around on different M health panels. And I would, I would fuel the idea of, I would say like, oh, I'm not an M health expert, which was like a way of reinforcing the idea that I was their M health expert. Um, and so, um, you know, was, was working for a lot of different groups. There's a, I'll give a shout out to, there's a group at Dietree International, uh, uh, also kind of came out of Harvard, was a group that I worked with a lot. They're, they're still based in Boston. And then around 2011, I, I shifted gears a bit and really went uh, kind of all in with this group, Damagi. Uh, uh, Comcare had been worked on by many groups, but we really wanted to, to productize it. I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, and have really focused on, on scaling it, making it effective, building up a business model around it. Um, so it's been a different kind of, of experience. Uh, and now I'm, I'm living uh, back in, in, uh, in Cambridge. I've, I've kind of handed off some of the operational stuff that I had learned and done and managed for a while. And I'm now like starting to shift more into innovation and evaluation of our systems. Um, so, so close to full circle, uh, uh, though uh, still, still a little bit different. Um, and the themes I have in mind for this talk are, you know, first to, to say that, you know, it's, it's, it's worked well for me uh, to try to apply technology uh, to um, improve healthcare or, you know, other, other sectors like agriculture, education. Um, and so, you know, I encourage you all to, to do it too if you're inclined. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, a lot of, of pitfalls and challenges and things to learn along the way. And there's a lot of, you know, the, the summary of it might be that the idea is the easy part. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, other things that, are, that are, uh, uh, have to go right for, for you to have that kind of impact, including uh, you know, certainly some luck and, and a fair bit of persistence. Um, in terms of our product, the, the fact that we've gone with a cloud product, just like everywhere else, turns out it's important here. So when I get to some of the nuts and bolts of Comcare, that's, that's sort of a distinct uh, part of that last phase of that we're working on now. Uh, and then also want to make clear that uh, Demagi is hiring. We're a fun place to work. Um, and so we're hiring uh, software developers, mostly based here in Boston, um, and then uh, for what we call field managers around the world. Uh, and that all, that all, I won't let you forget that. Uh, and if you go to our, our uh, website, you can see more, more details. Um, and then for the talk, I'm going to first talk about some of kind of my early years uh, before I really started focusing on, on mobile health or as I started focusing on it. Um, and then spend some time with just kind of some of the, the general lessons that we've learned, which I think apply to uh, probably a lot of things, but certainly doing uh, this kind of applying of, of information and communication technology for development. Uh, then talk more about Comcare and productizing it, um, and a little bit about uh, evaluation. Um, and then I'll, I'll say again, feel free again to jump in any, any time with, with questions, or uh, I'm, I'm probably less careful than I used to be about uh, using my, you know, the jargon that, uh, the health jargon or some other jargon that, that isn't clear. So, so please let me know if, I, um, if I'm using some terms that, that you don't know. Um, so I, I started work uh, uh, back in around 2004, 2005. I worked with a bunch of mostly AIDS treatment programs um, in East Africa. And I started working on uh, electronic medical record systems. Um, and the typical way that, that they were set up, uh, the ones I worked on then, and, and still a lot today to my knowledge, is, is they were primarily um, paper-based. Um, so during a patient-clinic uh, interaction, um, the, you know, the patient and the clinician would, would use paper forms and paper records. And then those records 
uh, those paper forms would get sent to a data center, get typed in by, by data entry staff, um, and then used to generate reports. Some reports could go to funders, uh, which is often a lot of the motivation for running those programs. Um, some of those reports could go to like uh, program managers, and then some of those reports could be individual client level reports that would go to uh, back to the clinician for the next visit. So you might you know, say here's an alert or something like that, which can be used the next time they saw the patient. Um, and uh, uh, I forgot the, the title of this slide, but um, so this is an example of a, of a report that I made um, in the first place I worked that, uh, that failed, um, which was, um, uh, this is a, a uh, one-page summary that, that took data from a lot of different places. Uh, this, this, uh, for interest, this was programmed all in SAS, the statistical programming language, which when I got there, that's what they were using. And we pulled all this together and we built this one-page summary of a, of a patient. Um, and it was, you know, an, it was an excellent uh, report while I was there. So like the clinicians, the people running the program, people from Boston who came over, like everyone said, oh, this is really, really helpful. Um, and when you, you know, provided a lot of information in a concise way um, versus like going through like a stack of papers that were otherwise in the form. Um, but it was really a lot of uh, effort to produce. So like when it was a big program, I mean, um, tens of thousands of people, even when I was there, um, of patients. And so like every week we were printing out like a thousand uh, pages and trying to get them sorted and sent to the right place. Um, and so when I was there, it, you know, it happened for a while and it was well received. Um, but then when I left, it uh, stopped getting done. Um, and at least one reason was that it, it didn't serve any, even though it was useful, it didn't serve like an essential purpose really to, to anybody. Um, and here's a second, uh, less effective, but much more successful report that I, I went from Tanzania to Rwanda, uh, worked with the group Partners in Health, which some of you may know, it's also uh, uh, associated with Harvard and, and around here. Um, and here's a report that is, is one row per patient. So there's less information. Uh, I'll give a, a bullet before. The, the previous one was a page per patient, so it had a lot more information. Um, and it has just like, you know, we put in three of the weights, so you could see the baseline weight, and the most recent two, where the other one had all the weights, and we could have a few alerts. Uh, CD4 is a lab test that, that uh, uh, people would need, so we'd put alerts for sort of some key things. Um, and then what it had was, it was really important, was it had an attendance column. So this was like a list of all the uh, patients in one group that were coming in that day. It's when we called it it's the consultation report. Um, and we worked, so there was one thing is we, we worked with the nurses, so they said add an attendance column. So we did, we didn't thought of that. Um, and it was really useful because they could take attendance and it was really short and so it was easy to do. And so like this report, you know, went on for years and years. For all I know, it's, it's still running and like if it was broken, the nurses would come and ask us, where's our consult report? Um, you know, it was really much more effective and, and it was, you know, serving that essential need and uh, was, was driven, um, you know, uh, by the people who were going to use it. Um, this was printed out in paper, yeah. So uh, when we get to, one of the motivations for mobile was getting something more interactive, but, but everything here is all paper. Uh, and, he, and here's a uh, unsuccessful report that was that same second program with Partners in Health. It was, I, I built some, it's like a two page summary. Uh, uh, is there a question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was going to, you were saying with the first report that yeah. was a page per person that. Yeah. It didn't meet an essential need, but that second one that was, you know, less data did. Um, but everybody liked the information in the first report. I was wondering what was the essential need for, you know. So, sorry, the, the attendance column. Oh, so okay. they needed to keep attendance. They wanted to know who was there. So that attendance column was like really functional. Okay. Like it would have made their life like operationally easier. Okay. Okay. I mean, it was also more lightweight. It was also. We iterated better with the, with the actual user, so there, there, are, there are more than one difference. Okay. Um, but that, that was what I was talking about, was that just that attendance column. I think if you took that attendance column out, that report would not have been nearly as successful. Okay. Um, and there was nothing like that in the, in the first report. Um, so here's a report I made for, for Partners in Health. It was like a summary of the, uh, of the program's activities. We got big hurrahs when we first sent it out. They said, oh, finally we could see you know, all this great information. We sent it out like once a week. Um, and then like at some point I stopped or the program broke and nobody, nobody complained. 
um, because like even though it was it was you know a nice report and it had a lot of useful information, there was like nothing really driving it. Like on Thursday night or something, we'd send it out to everybody's email. Everyone had too much email, so like you know they weren't expecting it or needing it, um, and they weren't um, you know probably most people didn't have time to really look at it, even if sometimes it you know might have some useful information. Not that much had changed from last week. Uh, at, at the first program in Tanzania, we made a less pretty uh, overview report. So this is a report of the, you know, this is like a summary aggregate report, uh, not per patient. And we had a similar one that was successful um, for, for several years. And the difference was they had a, a weekly management meeting. And when the manager, when everyone came in, like 30 people would come into one central place to talk for an hour, they would expect a big stack of reports and they would, you know, pick one up and they would browse through it and use it during the general management meeting for the program. And so like the IT team would scramble that morning to make sure the report was together and printed out and ready. Um, and so you know, anything we put into that report was really very, you know, very influential and it, was, it, it fit into the workflow and it was demanded. Um, and then at some point they actually canceled that weekly meeting. They went to some other version of it and those you know, reports stopped getting printed out. Um, so again, you know, this was in the workflow uh, or not in the workflow and it really makes a, a big difference beyond sort of the, the, the kind of inherent uh, goodness or, or potential usefulness of the, of the um, intervention. Um, so that's, that's on, uh, that was from when I was like working on, on really the reporting side of, of EMRs. But then, excuse me, I started working, uh, partly wanting to get more interactive and, and mobile technology getting better uh, on um, using PDAs to, um, you guys know PDAs still? So that's still, it's like a phone with, without the phone parts. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, to guide uh, uh, classification and treatment of, of childhood illness. Um, and so here's an a, a example of the system being in use. So this is a, a, basically a nurse uh, or clinician in, in rural Tanzania um, uh, who is uh, uh, attending to a, a sick child who might have fever or a cough or diarrhea um, with her caretaker, uh, probably her mother or, or maybe grandmother. Um, and then is following a, a protocol uh, that she's been trained on called uh, the um, uh, inter Integrated Management of Childhood Illness, the IMCI protocol, which basically says, well, first ask what symptoms there are, and it classifies these four symptoms, cough, maybe earache, uh, diarrhea, and fever, and then based on the, what are the original symptoms, you ask a few more questions, like how long has the cough been, um, checking for a few kinds of, of, of more detailed symptoms, and then it says, okay, we're going to classify this as pneumonia or severe pneumonia or, or, just, or, or just a cold um, or, or malaria, and then says here's what the treatment would, would be for it. So it's a step-by-step you know, -step guidance um, for the system. That's a, just a closer look at how, how it could look. Um, and so it's, it's well known that, that you know, clinicians who are trained on these protocols um, uh, you know, can be trained on them, know them, and then if you observe them, you know, a year later are not following them exactly. Um, that's true, I think, worldwide. Uh, I don't have the stats, but I think it's true here, here in Boston uh, uh, as well. Um, and so when we used our electronic system, you know, we did a study where you had an observer in both cases watching kind of, you know, regular use where you have a, a manual that you could refer to if you wanted to, or using the the PDA, we got higher adherence to the protocol um, using the PDA. Um, so like they're supposed to ask whether there's blood in the stool or if you've had measles in the last three months. And uh, in the typical use we saw, you know, only 56% of the time they would ask that question. But with our PDA, they would ask it 95%. It's not, not too surprising a result since we're, you know, when we're, they're watching and the tool, you know, prompts you for it. Um, and so that, you know, the, the protocols have been proven to be effective, um, very widely used, and so there's, you know, at least a clear path to how you could improve, you know, make better treatment outcomes um, through uh, a system such as this. Um, and I, I'm going to move through this a little bit fast, but I, I actually wasn't, uh, like, I, I uh, wasn't totally compelled by those results. Um, The, all at the end, there are some lines missing. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is just a sample of the different steps. There's going to be there's there's many more steps that aren't shown. Okay. 
Does that answer the question? And what is the number at the end? Is the number of, of I think that was the total number of steps that could have been followed. So, okay. uh, and this is a small sample. These, these results have actually been replicated at a larger scale by, by DC International, the group that I mentioned, who is also a partner in this work. Um, which was led by uh, Brian Dorenzi, uh, uh, another PhD uh, uh, alum from the University of Washington, um, that showed similar kinds of stats and more rigorously than this. Um, these were was a, a small sample and a not super rigorous test either. But um, to that, um, and then but and for the complete results, there's a I can give you the, the reference as well. Um, and so. Um, you know, I think it's, it's definitely valuable work. Damagi is also doing, doing more of this. We're uh, working in Burkina Faso right now for a big three-year project to, to roll this kind of thing out um, to, to several hundred clinics on a tablet. Um, but um, it, was, it was also from this work that I decided, or part of around that time, that I started to shift away from kind of facility-based clinicians to community health workers as a, as a main area of focus. Um, and some of my hesitations were that the you know, it was clear the clinicians knew the protocols. Like they, they knew that they were supposed to, that the protocol said to ask for measles or check for in drawing, you know, these different signs. And so, you know, I, would, I didn't have like a, a, you know, a strong sense that the system was really providing a value by um, reminding them of something that they didn't know. Like, you know, sometimes a checklist makes you, you like skip a step that you might have forgotten. And I think it wasn't the case of, of forgetting that was skipping it. Um, there's definitely cases where the clinicians didn't think that the step was necessary, even though the protocol said it. Um, and like an example would be, there are certain signs or symptoms that you check to see whether a child has severe pneumonia. Um, and uh, many clinicians will say that they, if they see a happy child laughing, they know they don't have uh, severe pneumonia. Uh, other clinicians might disagree, but, but people will say like, you know, a smiling, uh, laughing child doesn't, isn't that sick. And so there's really no need to like ask for those extreme symptoms, which I know they're not going to uh, lead to a severe pneumonia classification because it can't be, or they don't think that the family would, would follow that, you know, if they said you've got to go to this hospital for this case, they don't think they would anyway, or any, any number of reasons that they're intentionally skipping those steps. And so the, you know, the test we did uh, is, doesn't know like whether it would kind of work in the long term running it because we're there under observation. It's a, you know, biased in, for, for both conditions. Um, and, and again, I think, it, I think there's a lot of ways to address these concerns and everything, but these are some of the reasons why um, uh, I moved away, and then also like another pressure on things. These clinician visits are very short. Um, the, the clinics aren't always like busy all day, but they're you know people line up in the morning. There's a lot of pressure to get through people quickly. Sometimes the clinicians uh, are going to a, like a private practice in the afternoon, um, and so there's a lot of other kind of forces you're fighting against that are that are challenging. Um, and it seemed like it'd be tough to add supervision to these. Um, uh, settings like you know, the, the worst people to supervise are probably like surgeons or something, um, and uh, you know as you know uh, clinicians are, are or you know other lower level doctors are you know not quite that bad, and then um, so we were you know shifting to be more focused on on community health workers, uh, where, where at least I thought um, I would uh, have more impact, and so uh, this is a quote by the the one million community health worker campaign uh, from uh, the Earth Institute of Columbia University. Um, and it speaks to how important community health worker programs uh, can be. Um, and there's, there's several studies that show that uh, community health workers can, you know, well-run program can have dramatic impact, like reduce the um, uh, uh, neonatal mortality by 30 to 50 percent um, with really very minimal other, uh, you know, interactions, like not building, you know, new health facilities or anything, but just basically by encouraging more healthy practices and better uptake of services. Um, so often, you know, pregnant women will live uh, in, the, in an area where they can go to a clinic and get an antenatal visit, and uh, if they get four antenatal visits and deliver in a facility, they have, you know, much better health outcomes than if they don't, but still, like, they're not, you know, there's low uptake of, of both of those services. And so, you know, one thing that community health workers can do is encourage those, um, those signs. And then, and this, um, the challenges faced by community health workers felt more addressable uh, to technology, to, to at least to me and, and uh, some of the other folks who were focusing on this. Um, which, and you know, here's our, our, some of the challenges, I'll just go through them a bit quickly, but um, there are, you know, community health workers don't know, you know, like they're working in, in, in largely isolation without a lot of contact with uh, the 
the program that's, that's managing them. So you see the frequency of visits uh, isn't that high, which is something we can track and send reminders for. Um, the visits are often uh, short and informal, and they don't kind of go through all the steps. But if the system prompts you to go through, you know, it's more of a simple kind of checklist of things to counsel, um, we were uh, more confident that that would you know, increase the, the thoroughness of the visits. Um, sometimes sensitive topics are, are skipped. Um, and one thing that's nice about a mobile application is you could, you know, the mobile application can bring up the topic. You'll see later we have audio clips that can help, uh, like you could play the audio clip for something that's sensitive, um, and it lets the, the phone kind of introduce it. Um, community health workers are often given big flip charts um, that have pictures and stories on them uh, to engage their clients, um, but they're like, universally not carried around. They're kind of big and bulky. Um, but like a phone is easy to carry around, so there's a real advantage there. Um, and then there's a lot of um, uh, challenges around monitoring these programs, like even worse than the facility programs, uh, the community health workers often are, there's not a lot of information coming back or it's taking months and months to get back and it's at a uh, not very reliable level. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually not gonna talk about the details of it too much, although I'm happy to go into to more if you want, but our uh, uh, ComCare, um, product is a mobile application that, that runs on a phone, either a, a J2ME feature phone or an Android smartphone or tablet, and helps uh, extension workers, uh, and it, it can be, a, you know, I'll, I'll talk about community health workers, but just make a small note that it can be agricultural extension workers or educational extension workers, um, track their clients and provide them uh, support during visits. Um, and so um, this is a some screenshots from our, our India applications and, and the case management comes up in that these are like three um, uh, pregnant women who have been registered by the community health worker um, previously and that's their estimated due dates. And then when you drill into one, you get a little more details about their case record. Um, and then when you do a follow-up visit, so you, you, know, have the, you pick them from their case and then you get some information that shows you what their information you've collected previously um, and some prompts to like do follow-up based on information that was, that was there before. Um, and then during a visit, you, you know, so once you've clicked on one of the clients and your, uh, uh, you would see a series of forms that would be appropriate or could just be one that would be appropriate for this visit. It could be like there's different counseling forms you can do or just a general follow-up visit. In those forms, you're gathering more data that might update your record for next time or, or right then. Um, and you're providing support for counseling. Um, so we have multimedia, which is mostly images and, and locally recorded audio uh, files, um, though it could also be video clips. Um, the, the problem with video is just that it's expensive to make nice videos, so we don't get that many of those. And then these images are, are useful because they can be shown to a client, so you could like show you know, an image of, of uh, nutrition or washing hands and then play an audio clip. Uh, that talks, you know, like somebody perhaps with, with authority or somebody, you know, speaking about the value of washing hands. And it also helps low literate um, community health workers um, to use the application. Because even if you can't read, the images and the audio clips help you know what, uh, what's going on. And it, there's a, you could set in a mode where pretty much everything is read out to you um, as you're clicking through it, the, the prompts and the ans possible answers and everything. Um, and so you go through the form, you like, you know, it could just be a prompt that says, you know, okay, 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 if you're just making counseling points and you're just acknowledging that those counseling points were delivered, or it could be a series of questions, or it could even be the, like that IMCI protocol where you say like, you know, are they coughing? If yes, then the next question is for how long have they been coughing? Uh, and it can bring you through some simple classification. So is, is the um, information uh, that's being displayed, is any of that in the cloud? Or like when you're saying you can drill down and are you going out to get information? And if so, um, how do you manage battery life with the applications, or is there is that a concern? And That's a great question. Um, and so this this shows the, the the whole system a bit, and, uh, and and so some of the answers are yes and some no. So it, it, it runs offline. Um, so you know we we're typically um, and we, when we started it was probably even more true. We were really focused on a case where the you don't have connectivity during the visit, um, and then you connect. Periodically, it could be as you know, once a day or even even less frequently to sync with the cloud. Um, so during a visit, um, it's all designed to be local information. So that we actually don't have the capacity to to literally go back and get more um, from the from the server. But once you synchronize, everything is is stored um, in the cloud. So we could we could restore a phone, for example, if it gets lost, and then from the the cloud management. Um, 
people who are with the appropriate login credentials can, can track the activity of the community health workers and see all the cases and, and, and see the information or export the data and do analysis. Um, did I, and then battery life, um, it's still a problem, although not, not because we're syncing, but um, and that actually is why like the, the Nokia uh, feature phones um, are often still preferred in some, like, like in, for some large programs, um, even where the Android phone's <coughs> better and the same price, um, but the battery life and robustness like, are, are so, uh, dominate all the other advantages of the Android um, in, in some cases. Um, you know, hopefully that'll, that'll switch. We, we're, we'll be happy when everything's on Android because um, a lot of our systems work better. Um, did I answer all your questions? Yeah, yeah. I, okay, I yeah. had another question. Uh, the other one was just security features on the phone. Are you encrypting any of this, any of this data? What are you doing for security? Yeah, so we're doing the, the uh, and uh, others on our team could speak to it more uh, expertly, but we're doing the, the kinds of things that we can. So there's a password protection on the app itself. Um, and we have in the, the cloud is HIPAA compliant, um, secure, and when you're on Android, you get uh, encryption at rest on the phone um, and in transmission. I think for the feature phones, you don't get all those protections. Um, and then the other thing that we have, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, is the ability to configure these applications in the cloud. And that's really been like our, it's our big competitive advantage in terms of uh, Comcare being a successful tool, um, is that you could go to comcarehq.org, create an account, and start configuring uh, the application um, um, to whatever registration questions or follow-up forms or images and audio clips that you want. So it's sort of like uh, SurveyMonkey would be a simple example. Salesforce would be kind of a better uh, example of like an enterprise level system that takes, you know, basically like a business user, somebody with some savvy, but you can go through and design your own system. And this is a breakdown of the uh, 40 frontline programs that adopted Comcare in 2013 in India. Um, and so you can see there's a lot of maternal and child health, the kind of examples that I've been using, but also some in nutrition, a couple in tuberculosis, one in domestic violence, three in education, a couple in education. So you could configure it for you know, any kind of worker that's like tracking things over time and during a visit has some set of, of you know, data they should collect or counseling points they should make. Um, does, I've gone through that a little bit quickly, but do you get the, the flavor of it? Um, and so I'm gonna uh, shift gears a little bit. That's sort of been you know, a lot of what I've, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the path I followed to, to get to the launching of, of, and a lot of focus on Comcare. Um, and then uh, walk you through some of the kind of like general lessons or mantras that we've uh, developed uh, over the time of, of doing all this. Um, and they're all pretty, like on some level, they're all uh, kind, of, kind of obvious uh, and uh, you know, simple, like you know, be, be, be nice to your neighbors or something. That's a lot of the kind of stuff you learn in kindergarten. Um, in fact, I like to joke, and in, uh, in, in it's, it's just like what you learned in kindergarten, except in kindergarten they didn't call it open source, uh, they called it sharing. Um, um, which is a tough concept for a lot of the big nonprofit organizations we work with. Like we fight, we, like a for-profit social enterprise, you know, fight with them to make everything open source because uh, they're competing for funds as well. Uh, so it's all, it's all complicated and interesting. Um, but so I'll walk you through this and the, you know, the real point of these things is, is kind of the judgment it takes to, to apply them and so uh, you know, I think they're a little bit kind of you know superficial and, and obvious by themselves, but like have have depth too uh, as you're implementing these things, um, and and probably our, our you know if, our, if we had one that we can say that we've learned it's what we call uh, design under the mango tree, um, which uh, is basically just pointing to the need of having an agile, iterative, iterative, iterative um, approach. Um, like if it's like one thing we've really learned over the years is that we have just this continual stream of of, of brilliant ideas here in Boston, um, which don't totally fail uh, once they're tried out in real use. Um, and so we've stopped like, you know, trying to come up with a solution here, um, but instead um, really try to get, you know, we have an idea, we propose it, we will get something out, you know, like in, in some form to the users, um, but really, um, you know, allow it to evolve and, and get feedback and testing from real use. Um, and whenever we build system, this, this is a, a um, a picture of, of the, really the first group using Comcare. We spent months and months and months, uh, you know, could, have, could be close to a year with, with uh, maybe not a year, but maybe, maybe six months with these five 
community health workers that you see on the, on the right. And then there's uh, uh, three people uh, uh, on the left who are working for Dietri and Damagi who were developing the first version of ComCare. Um, and so like they would, you know, we were trying things out. We would ask them every week what they liked about it or didn't like about it. it took a while to build up the trust to be able to get really critical feedback from those community health workers who were, you know, not like, uh, um, you know, it wasn't natural to like say here, this is wrong and this is wrong. But like once they made suggestions and would see that those suggestions made it into the application the next week, um, you know, it really then more suggestions would come. And then from that developed, you know, uh, uh, a usable um, system. And even now, like now if we're developing, you know, we've done our 40th maternal health application that's pretty similar to the last. We don't need to have as much iteration on the content, but, but for any new, you know, content area, we would say, you know, tell us what, what the experts think and then let's get it out to the, to the field to let users use it and make changes for, for you know, a while, you know, weeks to months um, to improve the usability of the system. Um, and then another uh, uh, point is to, you know, often like when you see a problem or a challenge or something that's not working, like you're, you just want to throw technology at it and fix it. Um, but, you know, there's at least often the case that like the real problem isn't technology or if you, you know, automate a broken system, you'll just make it go, you know, have it continue to fail, but just, just faster. Um, and so, you know, often you need to like make sure the system is running well enough that, that automation can help it or find, you know, exactly the kind of intervention points that, um, um, where technology can make a little bit of a difference. Um, and, you know, again, it's a, kind of an obvious point, but it's a really uh, easy mistake to make to, to try to fix something where really clearly it's like, you know, if it's just like worker motivation or morale, um, then like throwing in checkpoints isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to help that. Um, and you might say like, yeah, really, you need to get this program, you know, you need to fix the other things that are going on with this program before technology is going to help. Uh, and then another of kind of one of my favorite stories that really like I, I certainly took away a lot from it was um, an example where we were uh, we were working with some community health workers in, in Dodoma, Tanzania. We had a very close relationship with them, and we're introducing all sorts of innovations. and And they were doing routine care, so they were like looking for like general problems that were happening in households. And we said, oh, let's add newborn care. Um, there's you know the the first 24. 48 hours of life are the most dangerous in, in certainly um, somebody in Tanzania. Like it's a very high risk time. There's a lot of things you could check for. Um, like if the child is cold, there's a lot of simple interventions like just having the child up against the, your skin. Uh, it's called kangaroo care. It can make a big difference. Or like if you have infection, you could get them to care. Um, so there's a lot of like really simple things you can do that have very high impact. You know, we were very excited to bring kind of this very life-saving information uh, to the uh, you know, the, the population we were working with. And so we had uh, a, a master's student from Johns Hopkins who, who uh, went out and we figured out the right protocols. We built the app and we said, you know, just use this during, right after a delivery uh, on the mother and child. And we had like, so we had it running and, and there just weren't, we again, weren't getting any pregnancies or deliveries. Like we were like, they, we, our community health workers were saying, ah, oh, there's just, you know, one person gave birth, one person, another person, but like a very small number. And we were like computing like we knew the population rates and the fertility rates and like we we're saying it can't be that there's so few. And then we were, we were running out of time when the master students w was leaving. So we said, okay, we'll offer uh, you know, a gift. If, if, a, if there's a delivery and, and our community health worker comes within 24 hours, we'll provide a gift of about $10 worth of uh, a clothing and some food and soap and diapers uh, to the mother. Um, and so like pregnancy rates shot up, like m maybe a little too high, but like we got three or five a day. It was very excite excitement. Um, and, and it was, and wasn't, you know, there's some situations where like, you know, even the community health worker, like you can think might be getting some, some, uh, some reward themselves. And, and I don't think that was happening here. Um, and it, what was, you know, the, one of the dynamics was just that the community health workers were so excited to be giving something of, of obvious value to the community. We thought this life-saving information was great, but it's like, if I give you an hour lecture on, you know, smoking or exercise or doing your seatbelts, um, you know, that might save your lives, but you're not going to be that excited by it. Um, and so in a similar case, you know, public health information and stuff like that, even when it's valuable, isn't necessarily, you know, that exciting. Whereas, like, you could tell the community health workers, like, this program, we actually, like, ended up, like, our funding ran out, we pulled out, and, like, the community health workers themselves kind of got, got very empowered. They, they 
we, from the money we gave them, they started a restaurant and started doing things. And, they, and they've continued some of that newborn gift program as part of their service because it was so important. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the public health stuff isn't happening uh, anymore. But like that was really seen as something that was like, you know, like they were like, I think finally not showing up at households and asking for things or like giving lectures, um, but able to give something real. And so just you know, thinking through all the different uh, aspects of like who needs, you know, who are the different perspectives, um, and where are you providing, uh, you know, real value. Um, uh, is you know the lesson I drew from from uh, that uh, that anecdote, um, and this is a, a slight digression into into a side venture from Damagi, but it's a lot of the same themes um, that uh, uh, that I've been talking about, um, which is uh, actually in a different project in Tanzania. I worked a lot in Tanzania. Uh, uh, a lot of my good stories come from uh, from there. Um, we were we were implementing Comcare. Um, in a place where, and one of the challenges was for a maternal health program was that women were, even though it was like, women weren't giving, were giving birth at home rather than in facilities. Even though there was a lot of, like the facilities had a lot of support, there was a lot of education around the value of it. Um, and so like we started brainstorming some cockamamie ideas uh, about like using an SMS and prepaying the transport and different kinds of triggers and things like that to add some technical solutions. Uh, and we were working with a Fulbright student uh, uh, who's now at, at Harvard, Tenny uh, Sovrenios, who was, um, he said, well, let me, let me just ask the nurses. Uh, it's like he mentioned our ideas, and they said, I'm sure very politely, uh, that those were not going to work. Um, and said, so just give the, the it's a similar to the last story, really, give the mothers uh, some soap and diapers um, if they deliver in a clinic, and they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, and so like they wrote a proposal, like we, we, they, we came in with a handwritten proposal for $615, which we funded, and they gave women this uh, $3 worth about of uh, soap and diapers if they delivered in the clinic. And, and deliveries shot up from like uh, 10 per month to 30 or 25 a month, like that. Um, so it really worked. Um, and it was interesting as well, because we wouldn't, you know, even now, like the, it was, a, you know, it was a something of a prize, the $3 was, was worth something, but it was even less than our other gift. And it was, you know, I think it was, it was somewhat an incentive itself. I think in some ways, um, the, uh, one of the complicated things that will come up later in this talk as well is that uh, in a lot of the places we work, the women who are pregnant aren't the decision makers for their care. Their mother-in-laws and their husband have a lot of control. And so I think this incentive also gave the woman who maybe had been bombarded with this education a, a little bit more power because they're like, I'm going to go get the soap and diapers um, by doing this. And that was, might have been an easier way for them to um, uh, kind of make the decision or, or convince their other decision makers in their household that they can go do it. Um, so that's speculation, but just to say that there are some interesting dynamics. Like we don't even really know why it worked, but it, but it certainly worked. Um, and uh, that from, you know, we, 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 what that taught us, um, and this is a, a little bit of a, of a digression, was that, you know, we shouldn't be making as many of the decisions. Um, and so then we started this other uh, idea called microgrants, and eventually started this, uh, or, or helped uh, helped others start uh, a group called Spark Microgrants, which takes small grants and uh, works with communities to launch projects. Um, and so this is a group of 80 women in Wantit, uh, Uganda, that that built a small school with about $1,600, uh, and then later got follow-on funding. Um, and so they, you know, we gave them the small grant. They decided education was the main thing. They did a ton of stuff. Um, and like now have a uh, thriving school that, that they really own uh, and it's, you know, it's theirs and they keep it running. Um, and then this is just a, a, a little overview of, of in 2013, Spark Micro Grants has, has kind of become its own thing. I encourage you to take a, take a little look. Um, and this just shows you, you know, all the different kinds of uh, projects that, that communities have um, launched of, of some agriculture ones, some income generating ones, some health ones. Um, and that's, that's really been a great uh, non-tech experience as well to, to uh, support that group. I'm going to skip a little ahead um, as uh, I've covered, I think, a lot of the, the, those other themes and make sure that there's uh, some time for questions. Um, and so uh, this is actually an old slide that I, that I remembered and dug up for uh, uh, this talk. But it's, it sort of gets at a lot, you know, the, that second theme that I talked about just to to kind of, and I wasn't, you know, I want to like both be like encouraging and say like if you're interested in this kind of thing, go out and do it. And then also like, you know, I had no idea how hard uh, any of this stuff was to actually make it make it real. Um, and so just to give you know a sense of like, you know, you have some some good idea or some technical uh, 
innovation. Uh, and then it's, you know, it's a whole other bunch of work to, to wrap that into something that's useful. Um, and then having something useful isn't enough. Like you've got to do a whole bunch of other things to actually get it used. Um, and then, you know, even if it's used and you think it should help, like actually seeing it really making an impact, um, you know, it's this whole other level. Um, and, and, and just to kind of point out that there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of things beyond the, the, the good idea to getting to successful implementation, um, which kind of brings me, and I'll, I'll just go quickly through uh, uh, some of this last stuff. Um, to talk about uh, Damagi, um, so, uh, and you've heard a little bit about this, so that's a, a for-profit social enterprise based here in, um, in Cambridge, in Central Square. We built open source, but we run a cloud product with hosting fees um, uh, and uh, service packages. Um, and we work mostly in health, but also agriculture and microfinance. Uh, we're, we're still hiring, uh, so uh, tell all your, your friends as well. Um, and we, uh, ComCare is our most mature product, but we have a couple others which I won't tell you about, but just to say that we also work in uh, some logistics and some SMS-based direct-to-client uh, projects. Um, our revenue has been steadily growing. Our team has been growing. We're about 80 people now. Um, and this is a, a, a graph of how we kind of want to think of ourselves that, like, you know, we're, we're not interested in getting uh, uh, big, though we need to, you know, steady growth has been necessary to, uh, just to have the reach we want. We have offices in India and um, Senegal and um, South Africa um, and some uh, other staff in, in a few other countries. Um, and this is a, 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 a rough approximation of our, of our uh, impact or usage, at least, of the number of cases that uh, we've, the um, uh, number of like, clients who've been registered in our system. And that's been growing exponentially. So we're you know, hoping we're on the right path to get you know, exponential growth of, of impact or uh, usage with, with just you know, steady growth of, of our uh, company itself. Um, and then just you know, to mention briefly, like you know, over the last few years in that productization stage, uh, I've you know, had to deal with a lot of things that I, that I definitely never dreamed I'd have to kind of worry about when I was back uh, leading the happy-go-lucky uh, researcher lifestyle. I like, had to deal with uh, USAID contracting. Um, if you don't know what that is, I won't even tell you. Um, you know, standard pricing plans and implementation plans. Um, competition between kind of like-minded open source groups doing the same thing, like you know, we all our first, any organization's or entity's first goal is to survive, uh, and that naturally leads to competition over funding and ego clash and everything. Um, just as an example, like, like, you know, we had to do a lot of like marketing and promotion. So like we, we came up with a package, we call it the proof of concept package that we offer sometimes. Like this is how we did 40 projects in India last year. So we got funding to engage those groups, and we offer a package of like 10 free phones and, um, uh, some technical support to launch Comcare. You know, it's kind of like a 30-day free trial kind of promotion. And it's, it's incredibly effective. Like, we were surprised ourselves. Like, you know, big groups, World Vision has a billion dollars of revenue worldwide and Save the Children and Care, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they have big budgets. Um, but, like, 10 free phones, which is not, you know, a huge amount of value, uh, is, is pretty attractive. Um, you know, partly, I think, just getting free equipment is, is like, an extra incentive. And then also, it just makes things so much easier for them. They don't have to procure the phones. That's hard. They don't have to like, have the risk of investing in it. It's like a very low risk way to try something that might be on their mind. Um, so like, this is an example. Like, even we had the good idea. We had a lot of the things. We had people who were kind of interested. But these extra, you know, figuring out the right set of, of marketing or promotions or incentives um, you know, is as important as, as any other component of the, of the system. Um, and then just to give uh, you know, a, a brief overview um, of, of how we see ourselves in the kind of larger ecosystem of, of M health systems, the, the three things we really focus on and are trying to do um, you know, all of is be a cloud product that handles complex workflows um, and is open source. Um, and our two products, Comcare and Comtrack, are both, are both that now. Um, and by complex workflows, I mean things like being able to track entities over time, offline, on a phone, and then synchronize you know, with a cloud server. There, there are other cloud products, mostly proprietary, that um, just do simple data collection, which is you know, super important as well. If you've heard of uh, Magpie or Data Winners or Open Data Kit, Open Data Kit's open source. Um, but they're all great systems, but they're mostly focused not on like, supporting a community health worker to track people over time, but on um, uh, like doing household surveys where you're just like, collecting one-off data. Um, 
And so it's a lot harder. Like those are those are simpler systems, like SurveyMonkey, more like that. Um, so anybody can use them. Our systems take more training, but you can do more complex things, uh, which we think are necessary for you know, the kinds of things we really want to work on, like improving health systems. Um, and then you know, being the cloud product has the kind of natural advantages of um, the fact that like, which is, it's been interesting. Like there, a lot of the alternative systems that are a little bit like Comcare. Mostly are, are still custom code bases. Like there isn't an equivalent website you can go to and design your own system. Um, but like just like Salesforce, you know, and Dropbox and all those systems are having a lot of success. That's you know probably more important than any of the of the features we have um, for being a deployable system. And then open source is you know we we, we believe in it. We want to contribute uh, at least have our code available. And it's it's also really important for kind of the the. Uh, uh, large scale, long term goal of a lot of our projects, which are often started by international NGOs, often US based NGOs, but they want to hand them off to the countries they're working on. And so having something that's open source is sometimes just a requirement of the government, or, and then also, you know, it at least enables uh, the ability to, for, you know, uh, let's say Ethiopia to take the code, have their own programmers, and just run the system themselves uh, rather than rely on a, on a vendor uh, like Damagi. So that, that gives you a little bit of insight into the uh, uh, product. I'm just going to whiz through a, a few slides um, and, then, and then open it up for uh, discussion um, to say that you know, we, have, we get a lot of, of, of uh, anecdotal positive feedback from our users, a lot of great quotes uh, saying the, the value of it. Um, uh, and this is sort of a, a, a community health worker called an Asha in India talking about the point of going through more thorough visits. Um, we have uh, an evidence base, which you can look online, the Comcare evidence base, which uh, summarizes uh, a, a large number of published and unpublished studies that give various levels of support uh, to uh, uh, the idea that, that, that it works. Um, we're still definitely in the process of figuring out if it really works. Um, and uh, there's a lot of kind of high level stuff, you know, just asking the, the frontline workers is, you know, level three, um, which is not, not all that solid. It's very easy to get hear what you want to and get positive feedback. Um, we have some uh, more robust studies showing that we, we've improved frontline worker behavior. Um, and those fall, you know, those are strong. They fall to the same limitations I mentioned that you never really know whether like you're just getting the behavior that's more standardized but not really effective like, like I mentioned for the uh, clinicians protocols. And then a few unpublished studies as of yet showing a client knowledge, attitude, and practice saying that like you could actually look at the clients getting the benefit of, of community health workers with Comcare versus clients with community health workers without Comcare. And you see that there's some at least better knowledge and maybe also practice um, as a result. So that's much stronger. And then the, the sixth level, we don't have anything there yet, would be like a real, you know, like the, the gold standard would be like a randomized control trial showing health outcomes of some, some kind. Like, you know, on the very high end, like mortality differences and on the lower end, things like different blood levels from showing that they had taken immunis uh, you know, uh, iron tablets or better immunization levels or something. Um, and then just to highlight one little study we did um, uh, in India is our, our community health workers have been, have been saying that like one of the advantages of ComCare was that it, it brings in a lot of those other decision makers to the conversation, that they were just talking to the pregnant woman before and now the, the mother-in-law, sometimes the husband or the father-in-law are more likely to, um, to attend. So we, we called, it's a pretty small scale study, we called um, uh, about uh, 30, did it say there? Uh, we called that many, 40 uh, uh, community health workers uh, for a period of a few weeks and asked them about the visits they had just had. Um, and we did get some, some good results, actually less than we had been sort of expecting from what we had heard, um, but still pretty significant that the mother-in-law was 1.6 times more likely to be uh, present in the, in the uh, conversation and the husband uh, 2.6 times more likely. The visits were also reported to be longer, um, so you know, it could just be that that's why uh, more people attended. Um, though we think it's you know, the device itself and the images and the audio clips uh, you know, kind of attracts attention. Um, and then I'm just gonna uh, also briefly mention that we're, we're just really starting to analyze all our data. Um, you know, we now have millions of forms and we're starting to compute a bunch of different usage indicators from, you know, number of forms to, uh, to percent days that they're active to how their follow-up rates are and looking at what, for what looks like batch entry. Like some of our users don't actually use it during visits, but instead, uh, you know, have the visits and then enter the data, you know, right, you know, one after the other, um, uh, perhaps in the evening. 
Um, and so trying to, to compute a bunch of these indicators and correlate them eventually with, with some kinds of outcomes. Uh, we're trying to figure out the best outcomes to correlate it with. And then this is just uh, one of the graphs that we, we did looking at the follow-up rates. And uh, these are the, on the row here, are just um, 30 different programs. Um, and you could, you could roughly see some pattern between groups that had been using our system for less than six months and more than six months, um, showing that they had uh, seemingly different uh, follow-up rates. Um, and so sorry, that was uh, uh, fairly fast. And then just my last slide of just noticing some you know, opportunities for collaboration. Uh, we'd love to figure out ways to work with you all. Um, uh, and you know, one thing we'd like to plug a little bit is if, if possible, like if you're thinking of something like this and if you uh, do it all on ComCare uh, or one of our other products, the, the advantage is that now it's a lot easier. If, like, if you make something that's useful uh, and you want to make it available to others to actually use, you know, our cloud product and the, the fact that we we're already kind of running all this stuff um, gives your, your system much more uh, possibility to kind of skip some of the, the difficult struggles that I mentioned before because um, you could just write it on, on uh, our, our platform. We have what's called the, the ComCare Exchange, which is a, um, basically like an app store. You can publish your app, apps onto that and then other people can take it. Um, we're interested to evaluate our other implementations. We're looking for help to analyze that data, as I just mentioned. And then, of course, uh, we're, we're still hiring. Um, so thanks a lot. Uh, and it'd be uh, great to hear any comments or questions you have. So uh, yes, but it's hard. Um, so you can, we have good APIs. So you, if you have your own uh, electronic medical record system and we're, we're integrating a little bit with OpenMRS, which is one of the well-known open source ones, um, you can, with, with some effort and some data mapping, you can link, um, you can take the data that's collected on ComCare and have it populate your record and, and vice versa. Um, but like it's not, um, it you know, certainly takes some effort to set that up. And we're part of this other collaboration called the Motec Suite, which is making that easier to, to connect different components together. Uh, you said a lot about, um, you made quite clearly, I think, uh, uh, how much more is needed to uh, get, get something actually used and successful beyond a good idea. Um, but if I can ask about the, sort of the, the good idea part, are there, uh, do you have any favorite examples of where some, particularly say computer science, uh, interesting computer science idea played a role in this, or where you see opportunities for in the future computer science research making a, making a difference in this space? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And let me know if I'm going on the right track with it. So like I've, I've been you know, connected to some of the ICTDD, ICTD groups uh, like at University of Washington and stuff, and there's like this, uh, uh, you know, question of like, is it, where's the computer science in this, or is it just like nice work? Like I was part of one meeting, not, not at UW, and like somebody said, well, you know, this is all great, but like, you know, Mother Teresa doesn't deserve a PhD in computer science. Uh, you know, she deserves a Nobel Prize, but that's different um, to make the point. Um, you know, and, and I, but I, I think there's been, you know, uh, it, there, there's been success in finding pockets of, of computer science. So, you know, Brian Dorenzi did his PhD on Comcare. Um, and partly it was like by finding like the, the, the last part of his PhD, which is probably the, like the most sciencey, um, was um, looking at different mechanisms for providing uh, reminders and feedback to the community health workers to see if you could increase visit rates. Then another, there are many examples that don't involve Damagi, but another good example, um, Ben Birnbaum and, and Brian did work to um, detect, uh, to, to pull out outliers um, from the data that comes back from community health workers. So, like you want to find, um, you know, question user pairs that that seem suspicious. Um, and so, like a question might be, um, um, are you uh, using family planning? So it's yes or no. So yes is fine, and a no is fine. But if over time, let's say the average for a group in an area is, for, you know, forty percent is the average over yes, and then you have one user who says, uh, you know, yes, eighty percent of the time, or one that says ten percent of the time. That's suspicious, right? Like over time, they should they should roughly match the average. You know, there's some possibilities for uh, things, but you probably want to follow up. They might, they if, if you're faking data, it's very hard to get the distributions right over time, um, or you might be uncomfortable with the question, or the question might not be clear. 
Um, so like Ben did some fairly like um, uh, you know uh, uh, statistical you know well well reasoned work um, to pull out those outliers, um, and then uh, we're working with uh, Emmett Brunskill at CMU just just now to like follow up and figure out how we can make this more useful and like figuring out like from the there's some kind of outliers that are interesting and that are not and seeing if we can do that. So that's some examples. I think there's I think there um, it's it's a little bit challenging and there's a plenty of stuff that's good ideas that doesn't make it into good computer science doesn't feel that sciency. Um, but I think also like like through like when, when I started talking to Ben, you know, after four or five conversations, we narrowed in on some some areas that were, you know, both pretty pretty, um, you know, clean or you know, uh, formal science, uh, and had you know were, that we could we could deploy. So that was a long answer. Did it uh, get out of you? Uh, but there's a lot of other examples too, uh, and, and the ICTD conference um, is a good good place to look for some. So one key element of what you presented is the creation of content, right, workflows and so on. So what's, can you give us a feel for what's the distribution of the kind of effort which goes into workflow and content creation, maintenance, and tailoring for different countries? How is it at the moment? And if you are not under financial constraints, how should it be? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and we are, it's the, the content creation for, for the launch, like just getting the ComCare app made, uh, has been going down, and we're we're keen to get it to be very little. So like, it was you know probably 80, uh, maybe it was maybe it was 50 percent of the total effort used to be there, uh, and now probably because for a lot of reasons we didn't have good examples, our tools were bad, <laughs> um, and and you couldn't easily share content, um, and now it's it's certainly way lower. Um, so like, in a, and 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 certainly if you're doing maternal health, if you're doing maternal health but in a new country. Um, you can copy, like it's, you know, pregnancies are very similar in a lot of the countries and a lot of things. Um, and the, you know, the, the so, you know, there's some differences, like what, what are the problems and stuff like that? And what are the medicines available? Um, but I'd say, you know, like the, the that's like, you know, a, a week or so of effort, very little effort for us to do the configuration now. And then, you know, launching a project is, uh, you know, if, one, if, if, you, if you pay us, one of our staff goes to country for about four weeks you know, it's probably about a three-month process of, of kind of getting going, um, and then you go into maintenance mode. Um, and we're looking to shorten that beginning part as, as we can. Um, now, that's like only the beginning of getting launched. There's a lot of other complicated workflows, like adding the supervision components, uh, actually making use of the data. You know, so figuring those parts out is kind of like the next frontier for us, and that's you know, uh, uh, going to be a big part of the process. So I don't, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it's because I don't, I don't know. Uh, but maybe it gives you some, some thoughts on it. How uh, different is it to do iterated design in sub-Saharan like Boston, Massachusetts? Or? It's way more fun. Uh, <laughs> so. Don't say warmer. I know that. <laughs> Sorry? He said, I know it's warmer. <laughs> and uh, mangoes and both. What? And uh, mangoes. Mangoes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> different trees, totally different trees. Um, yeah, so, well, I've, I've lost touch with what it's like to do it in Boston. Um, what, one key difference is, like, getting feedback um, requires different skills. You know, I think, like, you know, again, to, to characterize a little bit, but, like, in, in America, I think if you say, like, tell us three things you like and three things you don't like about a system, you could hopefully get three of each. Um, and like when certainly like when we asked in, in a lot of the countries we worked, tell us three things you like and three things you don't like about the system, we would get back five things they liked. Um, there's a strong sense, you know, it's hard to get, get critical feedback um, in a lot of the places we worked. And like there's some simple tricks like asking people to, like if you say, is this a good idea? Like very, there's a lot of uh, 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 motivation or momentum to hear yes um, back. Um, and this is, a, you know, even it was very strong if, um, you know, Americans, uh, asked us questions, like even when we worked with our Tanzanian colleagues like working at, at D-Tree and stuff, it was often pretty hard. Um, like work, work better was asking for ranking of ideas. So here's five ideas, and then which are the most important? And that created a much more animated discussion. Um, so there's at least like different styles of like how to, how to get that back. Um, and then, you know, I think there's a little bit, often like a little bit more freedom to maneuver. There are some ways in which it's easier, um, maybe, maybe often like the systems themselves aren't aren't so complicated. People aren't quite as busy. They're uh, like you might be offering more, like you know, like people like using mobile applications and getting some skills about that, or perhaps more excited, you know, like more excited to work just for that reason. 
versus like other kind of incentives you might have to, to bring in. Um, and at least in some situations, like you're not you know, competing with a lot of other distracting information sources or fewer other information sources, so you get a little bit more attention. Um, um, so yeah, so that's absolutely awesome. So the focus of Comcast seems to be uh, providing information for house workers. So have you thought about providing information for patients directly? Yeah, so, um, and that's, that's right. So mostly we, we work through the, the extension worker, the health worker, um, and we have um, a, a, a third system. It's not quite a product yet. It's called ComConnect. Uh, we're very uncreative in our naming, um, which, is, which is like ComCare, but it interacts by SMS. So if, for, for most of the places we're working, we, we have not um, pursued having like a mobile app for the patient themselves. Um, and I think that would be, be pretty impractical, like even like getting the phone for the community health worker is often seen as an impractical, it's on the cusp, some people like it, there's like, you know, uh, uh, contention around whether that's feasible. Um, so, and often the community health workers don't have, I mean, the population themselves don't have phones that can run an app or have that kind of, you know, also less literate. Um, so we're not, we haven't been interested in mobile apps in most of the places we work for the patient themselves or the, the consumer. Um, you could do SMS or IVR, interactive voice response systems. Um, um, and there's, there's, it hasn't been our focus so much, but we do some of it. And there are like some of our, our partner organizations do, do that as well. Um, one challenge of it, I mean, it, there's a lot of good things about it, is if you're building like, let's say, a big interactive voice response system that delivers information, you're, you're not strengthening the health system directly. You're in some level bypassing it or creating a direct channel, which is good when the health system is weak. It gives you a lot more reach. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a different approach than really trying to like make the health system stronger. Um, although, you know, it's a very, even that part is complicated and sometimes our app, you know, it's, it's hard to like strengthen a health system. Even sometimes our, our systems are somewhat parallel. Um, like they have to do paper forms and our system. So, um, so yeah, so also a long answer with a few different points. Are you using it in the U.S. anymore? Yeah, so we have a, a um, a few applications in the U.S., including some community health worker ones, um, and, and community health and patient navigators are kind of growing, so we're, we're pursuing that more. In the, in the U.S., you have the nice advantage that it can be cost effective, um, because like, uh, like we, you can save money, because the community health workers like have to enter the data and have to report it, um, and so there's like data entry costs that you could offset. Um, and we have some projects with UCLA um, doing you know, different levels of, of care coordination. Uh, we've done some reminder systems in the U.S. and some studies. Um, and so, uh, and probably one or two others that, are, that I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, and we're, we're actively exploring more, especially interested in the kind of community health worker projects. Like I learned that, you know, there's a migrant health worker issue in, in Maine uh, around uh, uh, the, the holiday season of, uh, migrant workers who chop down Christmas trees for sale um, and have a lot of health complications. Um, and there's some NGOs that are working to support those migrant workers, like I had no idea. Um, it's like that's an example of the kind of group that we would be very similar to the kind of groups that we work with in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. So imagine you're wildly successful with everything that you're trying to do now. What's next? Okay. Oh, there's more. Uh, so. What's, uh, 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 to, to say a little more about what you're, what you're, like what's next for me personally, or like just? Uh, uh. Well, I imagine that uh, throughout actually being on the ground uh, in a lot of these scenarios, you come in thinking that this is uh, what the need is, and to a large extent that is what the need is, but then you discover, oh, here are these other things that are also uh, really important, and we didn't think about that before we were in there and, and talking to these people. Right, so this, this, this may be, uh, it's a great question, which can be interpreted in a few different ways. So, I mean, if, we're, if we reach a, a very high level of, of success in the coming years, it'll, it'll really position us to do some good work. Um, and like one way to phrase that is like what we, you know, a, a good success of our uh, project would be that community health programs become smarter, more efficient. Um, and like, you know, we're going to have more information, like we probably already have as much information as anybody about how community health workers operate. 
um, and starting to like analyze that, figure out what feedback mechanisms work. We're in a position where we can run like experiments to see what's like the most motivating to community health workers, and and all of that should like help community health programs that don't even use our technology, just because they provide more insight into it. Um, as well as like if you really have real time coverage information, you can like you know really do some some important things so, like. Like one example, so if we know, if we have a fever map, we know like where fevers are occurring in a large population um, or where diarrhea is occurring, like that could allow, that provides like a real time information to see like what other things are working or not. So like if somebody's digging wells somewhere, you know, if diarrhea doesn't go down, um, you know, that's like we, could, we have the control and the comparison and all that. So like we should be able to like provide that kind of feedback. Um, so, you know, the hugely long, like the health systems, you know, nowhere and certainly in a lot of places we work aren't aren't prepared to deal with that level of information because they've never had it. It's like figuring out how to, how to make it useful and you know, provide those feedback loops is you know, the, the next big challenge. I'm not sure, I'm sure something else comes after that, but uh, uh, not sure. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's complicated, of course, because it's, it's private data. Um, and it could be shared by making it de-identified. Um, and it's, it's, the, the short answer is definitely yes. There's definitely interest in it. Um, and there's been, I don't know if there's, there, I'm sure there have been some big efforts to like pool data and stuff, although it's, it's surprisingly how, how little of the data that's been collected through ours and other system have even been analyzed once, you know, let alone shared. Um, so I think it's a, it's a big future opportunity. There is a lot of information there. Um, and uh, it's, you know, the, the, the next steps are probably just making good use of the data, like, you know, even, even for the program that's collecting them. Um, but beyond that, I think there is a lot of potential for, for sharing data if it, once it can be done, you know, uh, uh, safely. But we haven't, we haven't been involved in anything like that yet. Privacy uh, uh, just now. Are there differences in, in the way one thinks about that issue um, when do, in the developing world um, versus uh, versus here or in Europe, uh, for, for example? Yeah, there, there, there are certainly different. You know, I mean, like there's differences here now compared to here 50 years ago and 50 years from now, um, and um, probably differences in different states and stuff. And there's definitely lots of pretty striking differences in the value that's placed on privacy and confidentiality. Um, and, then, and then there's certainly others who will say, that, I mean, like, there's, there's definitely every, you know, every, the full spectrum is represented for every country we, we work in and people who would have the same exact, you know, very high level, you know, privacy is paramount. Um, and then, like, you know, there are examples, like, we worked in, I've worked in hospitals where they, you know, listed the patient, the HIV patients who are meeting this week, you know, were listed on the hospital wall by, by name. Um, and there are people who say, well, yeah, look, we don't have time, we don't have the luxury to worry about confidentiality. And then there are people who definitely say, yes, you do, and it's just as important, and um, it's, it's like there's no, I have no easy answers. Um, definitely there's, you know, the laws are different. Um, uh, you know, India has very strong data, data privacy laws. Some countries have mur much murkier ones. Um, and I'd say the, you know, the general uh, attitude towards it um, you know, varies and it's, it's probably like there's more, you know, like HIPAA has made, made things, people much more kind of sensitive and restricted in the U.S. than it was not that long ago. Um, and I'd say like overall you'd see less concern, less, you know, uh, things on a day-to-day on -day level. Um, though still lots of, obviously lots of, lots of concerns. And one, one interesting thing I point out sometimes is that, you know, for the community health workers we work with, you know, the phone provides some, you know, making the data electronic provides some extra risk to the data. Um, you know, now anybody in the world could hack into our system. But on a, on a local level, it's much more secure because what they used to have was just a paper book where they'd write down information. And so um, there are, um, you know, like anybody could pick that up and, and read who has a, who's HIV positive if they know that community health worker is serving HIV positive or chronically ill patients, um, whereas the phone is much tougher to get into locally. Um, and then I'll just, you know, one other anecdote just came to mind, which was a good lesson for us is, um, you know, and we definitely, we've, 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 we've seen that being appreciated. People are happy that their names aren't being written down and they're in the phone. 
Um, but the, the anecdote, we were in the early days of, of that testing, we were trying different phone models. And so we like, had five different models or three different models, and we let the different community health workers uh, try out the different ones to see so they could each see what they liked best. And then one reported back that, that one of the, their clients got mad because they noticed the phone was different. And they're like, well, who has my data now? Like, you know, like they were, and like, we just hadn't thought, uh, you know, did our own uh, just lack of, of you know, or, or, or oversimplifications. Um, we hadn't thought that the clients would be that savvy um, to that detail, but like they, you know, they picked it up and were concerned that their data was on somebody else's phone. Um, and so, anyway, long, long non-final answer as well. Um, but, but it's an interesting topic for sure. Thank you, Bill, very much. Thank you.